Welcome to Disaggregated System Architectures for Next Generation HPC and AI Workloads. I'm Timothy Prickett Morgan. I'm the co-editor of The Next Platform. And uh, I'd like to start off by just having our distinguished panelists introduce themselves. Uh, let's just do this in order. Uh, John, you're next. Hi, I'm uh, John Schell from Berkeley Lab. And um, uh, I'm the department head for computer science there. Thanks. Uh, Vladimir, you're up next. Uh, Vladimir Stoyanovich, Chief Architect, IR Labs. And Doug? I'm Doug Carmine. I'm a Distinguished Engineer at Microsoft looking at future Azure data centers. And Ian? I'm a Principal HPC Strategist in the Advanced Technology Office of Livermore Computing. And we're going to round it out with Josh. I'm Josh Fryman. I'm a Senior Principal Engineer at Intel Corporation looking into future research and pathfinding issues in architectures. All right, welcome to you all. Uh, I'll just go over the agenda really briefly on the next slide. I'm gonna speak for just a few minutes to set the stage, kind of prime the pump. I'll just start by saying, I'm very excited about disaggregated architectures. So I'll leave it at that and then I'll get into it in a minute. The bulk of this is a panel discussion, which will last approximately 40 minutes. And then we're gonna open it up for Q&A for 15 minutes. So the interesting thing for me uh, is what's driving the need for new architectures in HPC and AI. You know, it, it used to be simple. We could buy a bunch of CPUs, we could buy a bunch of networks, uh, we could lash them together, and it was a fairly uh, homogenous architecture. But the end of Moore, Moore's law means that we need to use accelerators and other kinds of devices to increase the performance of these systems and the energy efficiency and lower the cost as well when possible. Um, we have AI in particular, which is at the moment uh, dominated by uh, GPU computing. Um, so we need to integrate all of these different devices together. So that's the first thing. We have this explosion in compute capacity needed for both, both HPC and AI. We also need flexibility. Um, all workflows are not the same. And we need to have a variety of different devices to have efficient computing for different parts of a workload and across workloads. We don't have that kind of flexibility. When you create a system uh, from architectures that you expect to be in the future five years from now, you're kind of stuck with that. It's not, it's not flexible at all. Um, as I said earlier, costs are a part of this too. We have to get more energy efficient with our systems. We have to have more compute per dollar. And that's what's driving heterogeneous architectures to begin with. And it's not just about GPUs anymore. There's FPGAs and all, all, all kinds of custom ASICs that are being brought to bear to provide compute capacity for various kinds of workloads. Um, memory is one that I'm, I'm very fond of picking on. We have fat and slow memory, and we have skinny and fast memory, and we, we can't get enough of either. <laughs> and the tyranny of the memory controller, um, you know, you, you often pick a processor for the needs of the, uh, because of the needs of memory that you have. Um, so we, we need to have a different way to hook memory into the system that provides enough low latency and enough high bandwidth that it looks like it's local the way we're used to thinking about it, even if it isn't. And, and this is where I think silicon photonics is going to really be a game changer uh, for the new architectures. And throughput, I mean, you know, we're, we are seeing some advances, you know, PCI Express is back on the map again, and we're getting a doubling every two years. Uh, Ethernet and InfiniBand are back, but we had a, a very dry spell where things were not moving very fast at all. And we also know that eventually, the electrical signaling is going to run out of gas. We know it's coming and we can argue about what that means. Uh, that's part of this conversation, but we know that we're going to hit a wall there and we're going to hit it pretty soon uh, by the standards of the supercomputing and AI markets. Uh, next slide, please. So I have a slightly more uh, aggressive uh, slide in my head when I, when I think about what is a disaggregated architecture. I kind of grab a motherboard and I smash it on my desk and it breaks into pieces because the motherboard is the problem and, and the socket is the problem. We've, we've integrated the memory controllers and the network controllers into the socket. So now they're static. We, you have to decide way ahead of time, how many memory controllers do you want? How much ethernet do you want? Um, that's, that's the first tyranny. The second tyranny is now the motherboard you know, you've got this many slots, this many processors, 
this much physical space, this much cooling. This is not the right way to do computing in the future. It, it worked okay in the past, but it's not going to work. So what we really need to do is smash all of these components apart, pull them together and have lightning fast, no, more than lightning fast, photon fast interconnects between them. So they all look local to each other and they can be composed on the fly to exactly meet each particular workload. That's what this is all about. It's not just disaggregation, it's composability. And this is, this is what future systems will look like. There's no question in my mind about this. And I doubt anybody on this panel will say anything otherwise. We've been waiting a long time for this moment. I've been waiting a long time for this moment. And I'm so excited that some of these technologies are being brought to bear finally. So let's start with the first question. Um, at its heart, this disaggregation is about smashing up that server node. What's the best way to do this? And I'll pick on John first. OK. So um, it, it, the, the real issue is escape bandwidth. And as you mentioned, you know, copper is always uh, uh, challenging to uh, run high speed, but also at a distance. So you take a huge hit once you get out of the package. And then you take an even bigger hit once you get out of the motherboard. And, uh, and we never are able to recover from that. Um, what's really exciting is that the emerging packaging technologies, uh, oh, and we're getting to the, the limits of what CERTES can do. You know, going to uh, 112 gigabits per second or more, it's, it's, it's getting uh, to the point that we're spending more power driving electrons around than we are getting useful uh, work done. So going to photonics, the exciting confluence of packaging and photonics is that uh, the most efficient way to do the photonic stuff is wide and slow, which is many wavelengths of light, uh, but it's slower data rates per channel. And this is uh, matched up with what's happened with high bandwidth memories, uh, where you have uh, copper pillars uh, co-packaging. Uh, and so now rather than just cram cramming as much memory cubes as you can into a package, we can cram uh, silicon photonic uh, devices into the package. And now we get escape bandwidth. So we can get out of that package at a gigabit, uh, terabits per second, terabytes per second. Once you're able to get out of the package at terabytes per second, it doesn't, it, with photonics, it doesn't matter if it's on the motherboard or if it's somewhere else in the rack. Uh, now I can flexibly configure things with broadband circuit switches and I can get that flexibility, but I also can get that bandwidth that I need. Can uh, we afford this, Doug? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I mean, one of the keys is going to be um, making sure that there's interoperability between uh, the types of devices, because like um, the disaggregation vision that you 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 painted um, resonates with us. But we want to be able to connect CPUs, GPUs, uh, storage, and memory, and we need some sort of way of um, doing that at scale with uh, cost-effective means. And you know, one of the things that uh, seems like it's uh, good enough is uh, CXL is a, is a protocol layer running on top of PCI Express. It, it, um, you know, it isn't the, the very best, but it's, it's, uh, it's great and has emerged as uh, um, kind of the winner of the uh, protocol wars that have been happening over the last couple of years. It looks like it'll have uh, broad adoption. It supports um, interoperability of these devices, but probably most importantly, it allows um, the segregation of the protocol layer from the physical layer running on uh, PCIe physicals, which gives us good scaling going from 32 gigabits per second in Gen 5 to 64 gigabits per second in Gen 6. I think that that's going to be a good uh, way of leveraging an ecosystem to drive costs down, but yet um, maintain some sort of um, uh, compatibility um, as we go forward. Ian, what do you think? Is this the best way to do it for now? I mean, I think of PCI Express with CXL and some of these other protocols that ride on top of it as kind of a dry run for what I really want. Uh, what, your, what are your thoughts here? So we're doing the dry run a little bit with AI accelerators today at Livermore. We're putting an AI accelerator over the network and this is a great application to do it with because it's a little bit of data in, a lot of compute, a little bit of data back out. And so you can even do this over current InfiniBand to show it's possible in applications. Where I get worried is, you know, if I have latency sensitive things that are paired with a CPU, even being across on the other side of a rack might be a challenge. 
but to my GPU compute that's already used that fat and wide, you know, bandwidth protocol, it's probably going to be okay. And so there's going to be some questions as to, you know, what is amenable to this, but we need to take steps along this, along with having that big vision of let's just smash everything. And I think approaching it from both directions is going to be key to figuring out how this works and what it works for. I meant smash in the most loving of ways. <laughs> Josh, thoughts? I think one of the challenges you're looking at here is, as John was talking about, you have these limits that you're facing in the coming 30s. At the package level, you've got a top side fit issue and a bottom side fit issue. You can't escape the package with enough pins at an economically reasonable point that people will pay for it to get those kinds of bandwidth easily. And going to optics hopefully gets away from the that problem, but it still has to be economically viable. The second issue that Doug was alluding to is the protocol. Doug made a brilliant comparison against the network models, link layer, physical layer, datagram layers. One of the challenges you have though is that your ability to do this kind of disaggregation is fundamentally limited by the latency of this path. And if I'm using a very high speed protocol with very high latency requirements, FEC overheads, I cannot do things like disaggregate memory because I cannot compensate for the additional latency from a workload performance perspective. It has to be a system optimization. Many things have to be very tightly coupled, very high bandwidth, very low latency, very high radix because they're very sensitive to it. And those protocols can be great there. Then you have the larger system, your data center scale, total disaggregation. You may have different protocols working there. But in the standards can, uh, you know, view of this universe, we can't pre-select the standards. We have to get the technology right. The standards will follow it. But it's absolutely important we get to those standards for interoperability. All right, Vladimir, you obviously are testing a lot of these ideas out. Uh, you win the best name of a product award from me for Terrify. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit about how you're tackling this problem. Yeah, Terrify is my favorite name too. Um, you know, this this is uh, Josh hit some uh, and, and previous speakers hit some really good points. Um, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg in terms of where do you, where do you inject the innovation in the whole system design, right? Um, and one very good example is just what Josh was mentioning a moment ago, is that you know, like even in the existing or the evolving standards like CXL. Um, you know, there's opportunities to harden certain things in that protocol stack and, and do certain bypasses that would, uh, you know, optimize the latency to maybe an acceptable extent. But, you know, you need to kind of know that you would be integrating this with, um, let's say, a photonic technology, that type of ASIC with the new type of te photonic technology to be able to leverage that, right? So there's, an, there's that cycle then of, when do you commit to this new ASIC um, or new, um, let's say, call it CXL IP that will support these low latency features at the point in time when you would have the photonics as well. And so you could easily skip an ASIC cycle and delay the whole thing by two to three years, just even if you have the right elements of the protocol. And obviously, as Josh mentioned, you would want to optimize the protocol as well to evolve beyond something that is... Um, currently available, it took quite a while for things to settle in CXL, right? But when you think about, for example, it took um, a lot of competitive effort. And then exactly, and, you know, and, and kind of the demise, or let's say the slow slowdown in Gen Z, and you know, a, a lot of environmental things happen there. But if you look at even CXL, fundamentally, there's currently no um, no discussion of incorporating the best FIs kind of at the level, except like PCI Express. And think of it as where the world is going right now is with white parallel IO, as, as John mentioned, right? You know that white parallel IO is the most energy efficient. There is two and a half D packaging technology that can al already do it. It's most bandwidth dense, it's most compatible to optics, right? But you look at CXL or PCI Express standards. Yeah, with small tweaks, you could kind of jimmy that in, but you know, it's a standard. So it takes a while to set it up and promulgate these changes so that the best solution wins in the end. And I think that's gonna be our challenge. Um, whether you can do proof of point designs that are not strictly standard, 
but later drive the standard by, and you know, maybe that's what Josh was alluding to as kind of, let's say a lighter weight protocol, more tuned to optics, um, something that actually can be a potential for the next generation of the standard, but as a proof of concept kind of already catalyzes the, the community, you know? And I think that's kind of what IR is fundamentally trying to create uh, with our partners uh, not necessarily something that's already out there and specified, but something that points to a good way to potentially go about and do it. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead on a question because it, it came up naturally here. So let's talk about standards for a minute because I happen to think there need to be several different ones. Um, you can't just have a hardware standard. This is about composability. Mm -hmm. There's going to need to be a software standard too so that the way that people make use of this, and I'm thinking about supercomputers in particular, I'm, I'm like, how is this going to, how's this stack going to work? Who's going to agree on what it can control and how it gets controlled? So, uh, you know, uh, Josh, let's try you first this time. What do you think about how the standards have to evolve for all of this, the, the entire stack? We can't just have a piece of this. We want this done now. We want speed. We want to do it right. Yeah. And we want to do it right now. I'm going to agree that it's going to take time. There's no panacea. There's no canned solution that can be applied here. If you yeah. just start with the very basics, the very first issue you have to solve is an actual, genuine, scalable, virtualizable global address space. Because if you do things like separate memory from the actual sockets, you're not going just to a NUMA domain. But we carefully design architectures, GPUs, CPUs, AI and devices to interleave accesses across multiple memory controllers to avoid hotspots. And if you put those across a one link, you now have a massive hotspot queuing issues, the system stability is gonna go over. So you're gonna to have to rethink not only how do you design the protocols at the hardware level, the very basics of the address map and how it's exposed, how TLBs work. You're gonna to have to think about how does software reason about how it allocates resources at a specific location. And if you go over to Rohammer or some of these side channel attacks, how do you ensure that you need a secure malloc that says, I can't have shared resources. The DIM or the HBM stack that you allocate to me for this job cannot have co-located data from other jobs. There's an entire descriptive language about resource needs for a given compute phase, let alone multiple programs together, that we don't even have words for. Then this has to come. That sounds pretty impossible. I was all optimistic when I started this. <laughs> John, you've depressed me more than once at SC with your your um, your presentations that tell it like it is and scare me a little bit. So, what's your thoughts here? <laughs> I, 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 as a computer architect, I find that stuff exciting. <laughs> so, uh, no, I verify indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, CXL, uh, you know, that's, it's great that we can serialize link uh, memory traffic over a link and it, you know, it, it, it can express things in 128 bit address uh, is, is built into it with its, uh, um, so that's good. But I think Josh is exactly right. There's more than just the, uh, the line protocol, the link protocol. We have to have a control plane. Uh, we have to do resource allocation. Uh, all of our security models today are based on the idea that everything is co-located on the motherboard. And so the, you know, the, the OS of that CPU is master. Uh, the notion that uh, in order to disaggregate effectively, I need to share resources. And so we don't have a notion of what is the protection approach for uh, fundamentally shared disaggregated resources. I, I, I feel that we should be able to do it. Um, uh, you know, there is experience in uh, file systems, a lot of file systems and parallel architectures today for all practical purposes are disaggregated in a sense. And, and, and we do work through the uh, differences between auth authentication and authorization at a very fine granularity, uh, but we only apply it to our file IO. And now you have to imagine such uh, granular uh, security apparatus applied to all disaggregated resources. It can be done, we've seen it, but it hasn't been done yet. So we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves. Is memory the last thing that we can do it with? I mean, the accelerators, we can do it with PCI Express today. I can name three vendors that can give you the control plane to do it. Um, you know, this is, this is something that we've been arguing, like do that, please, you know, <laughs> put your stuff in a JBOG or a JBOF or whatever, the other, the other F, uh, uh, FPGA, not flash, um, you know, don't, 
put everything inside the server node, disaggregate wherever you can, drive up the utilization um, and make yourself more configurable so you can adapt to different workloads because I don't think we can predict workloads as well as we'd like to think we can. Not, not today. The AI frameworks are changing too fast. The data analytics workloads are changing too fast and they're gonna be GPU accelerated and accelerated in some fashion as well. Everything's gonna hit the Moore's Law's limits at some point. So is, is memory the last thing we're gonna master? And maybe we never master it, I don't know. Josh, you, you scared me a little bit. <laughs> So, so I, I think you're going to master your NVRAMs first, right? Because you can tolerate the latency and you can have a little bit of software that helps you manage it better. You're already dealing with high latency memory. And so the fabrics don't matter. You can afford a little bit of overhead for a lot of applications. Um, I think GPUs and those types of accelerators will be able to deal with disaggregated memory because they're already latency sensitive first. Whether we can ever do this with the CPU, as I mentioned early on in this call, is not clear because a lot of the workloads that are going to stay on a CPU are going to stay there because they're latency sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so you are going to need a really good story of how those extra switch hops, much less any extra control, doesn't add on to what is already high um, sensitivity to low latency. All right. I have I have another, John, do you have a thought there? You raised your hand. Yeah, no, I, I, I did want to comment that it is possible that our standards will bifurcate because I can see from memory technology and uh, where there is latency sensitivity that you would probably not want buffered packet switches intervening your connections. You might want to uh, have circuit switching and, and no forward error correction if you can get away with it. So your loss profile is going to be different your um, uh, just the general fabric will be different. Whereas for GPUs or also for things that are going a long distance across the machine, uh, suddenly the latency incurred by forward error correction is not the loss leader when you go longer distances across the machine room uh, or are using devices that are more latency tolerant such as you know, NVRAM already has a lot of latency in it and the forward error correction isn't gonna be adding significantly. So the, at the physical layer, there may be, that that may be the reason why we would split, uh, uh, you know, uh, allow forward error correction, allow buffering, uh, whereas other things like high bandwidth memory, I think that I would wanna get rid of FEC and get rid of any latency in the critical path. So the next question I have is, what's the, what's the unit of compute gonna be in the future in I, 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 don't, I don't differentiate between HPC and AI quite so much. Um, you know, I keep thinking it's a rack and then I keep thinking it's a row and then I keep thinking it's a data center and maybe I, uh, next week I'll think it's a region. <laughs> you know, I mean, when we can connect these things at high bandwidth, low latency, at great distance, and we can pool these resources together in some fashion and we can compose them as needed, you know, what, what do we think of as the, the natural unit of compute? I'm so used to thinking about servers. This would make me a little nervous. So what, what is the, Vladimir, what's the, what's the natural unit of compute going to be on the other side of this? Let's assume we solve most of those problems that we were just talking about. No, ultimately, um, given that we can, we now have the capability to build a very low latency physical photonic interface that's high bandwidth. Um, really the limit, you start, comparing the latencies to really the time of flight on the fiber. And, you know, then you just draw a circle around uh, the unit of compute or the originator of the data and trying to understand wh what's the tolerable uh, latency in the protocol for that type of application. Um, and, you know, you're already, I think Josh has a really nice slide kind of rack scale where can you reach with within how many nanoseconds? Uh, but ultimately, that, that's really what's going to limit you. If you want to go, um, you know, 10 nanoseconds round trip, it's a meter of fiber, right? And there's really no way uh, about going around that. We can already design optical phis that are within several nanoseconds per phi, um, directly interfacing to the ASIC. And that's good news, you know, it's, um, low bit error rate, no FAC, so no additional things that typically you'd have to deal with in kind of, let's say, a pluggable kind of environment. Um, but, you know, ultimately it is the mother nature limits you to five nanoseconds per meter, and that's what you need to, to be able to tolerate. Interestingly, 
going back to you know even some comments that John mentioned, you know even in high bandwidth memory applications, uh, it's not complete disaggregation, but you could you have enough bandwidth with photonics to provide at least uh, some local pool off the socket that can be shared by maybe a few nodes um, mm -hmm. and be able to repartition the system and evolve it in a sense of growing the capacity, let's say maybe 10x um, for the same bandwidth to uh, provide kind of a sweet spot for a bunch of applications and it kind of decouple the evolution of the CPU or the GPU or XPU from the HBM. So those are maybe some things also to keep in mind in addition to kind of just pooling of general, uh, you know, memory pools like DRAM or NVMEs and, and things like that. I, I think of it as a concentric rings of decreasing coherence. You know, we'll be able to do something that's very clever and wonderful, you know, within a range of, you know, you tell me a couple of meters. Um, and then yeah. after that, you're, you know, then it gets less interesting in some ways. Um, then it's just really, really fast networking. Um, I think for all the kind of memory semantic fabrics we're talking about here, I think, you know, just looking at the speed of light and what we can do, you're de a few rows is definitely something that's acceptable, mm -hmm. right? And definitely rack scale. So you can do a lot within a pod that size, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let, and rather than just spend a lot of time on that question, unless anybody has some thoughts, raise your hand if you think that's right. <laughs> Go ahead, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to say I don't think it's entirely right. Uh, fundamentally, I would argue that the classic notion of the socket is really a statement about that latency, bandwidth, connectivity, energy efficiency. And the classic notion of exiting a socket is moving into a domain that's much worse than at least one of those metrics, if not all those metrics. Let's assume we've solved all the other issues. Let's assume we have this fancy optic technology or some other equal technology that I can punch around very easily. The reality is hyperscalers aren't going to want to install racks with 50,000 optic cables coming out of the back of them. There has to be a field serviceable, manageable physical installation. So even if you wind up with nothing but a sea of chips that are optically linked inside the rack, there has to become a natural attenuation to physical plant assembly that will limit the size of what you do and what you think about as a unit. The, yeah. the, the other trend that's happening in the data center is that um, because of the way that we're being pushed for efficiency is that the, what was a rack um, is, is turning into something that is a uh, uh, much different shape. You know, we're, we're, we're dreaming of hundreds of kilowatts per pod type of thing. And that's uh, by its nature, pulling all of the um, units closer together. So, you know, Timothy, if I go back to the way you, you, you smash the motherboard on your, on your, uh, desk that we're, we're also smashing the concept of the rack, um, mm -hmm. you know, over the head of the data center. And, um, and we're thinking about that, what was a rack of just being a lot uh, tighter, close knit of these um, uh, devices. And, and, you know, I think I'd go back to the point about, you know, draw a circle around what is the latency associated with the types of devices that you want to connect as a first order principle of the way that you think about um, a domain that was a, that used to be a rack. Any other thoughts on that I, on that uh, concept there? Or are we are we on on to the next question? <laughs> well, maybe uh, just a brief. Sorry, does anybody else? Yeah. yeah. So you know, like like in everything, going back and looking at the electricals, what dominates the complexity of the motherboard and the edge is the connectors, right? And the footprint and signal integrity. Um, with optics, you kind of simplify all that in one way. But, you know, as, as Josh mentions, you need to now host these new optical connectors or new ways to do fiber management, right? Um, from power delivery standpoint, you, you want to kind of keep things close. But the question is, what's the right form factor of things being close, right? Maybe it's a sea of little cards that are optically connected because there's more room now for that optical physical connectivity, but you don't care about the motherboard level signal integrity, right? So I think there's definitely room to innovate at the rack scale and chassis scale to incorporate the optics in the right way and also reduce the cost of the unit that you're manufacturing because you no longer have to manufacture a socket or a full motherboard. You can manufacture smaller units that are tailored to that device. 
and then yeah. use the fabric uh, to interconnect them in some more meaningful way to allow for cooling to happen in a more meaningful way to the places where you want. And also the overall assembly and production of the rack. But you have to think rack level to get to the best solution there. Yeah, if you have good signal integrity with the photonics, uh, I, I actually think that moving to disaggregation enables you potentially to get to a smaller field replaceable unit. Um, whereas the electronics is very twitchy, uh, signal integrity is a serious issue. And so it makes it, we, we've ended up seeing the field replaceable unit get larger and larger. I hope that disaggregation of photonics can reverse that trend. Josh, go ahead. I'd actually point out that while that's an interesting idea, the fundamental challenge to it is that these optic modules, the E to O, O to E transition, mm -hmm. and the laser, and the connector, and the cables, all has to cost the same as a high volume socket today, which says you get an optical bridge between two packages for less than 50 bucks. If you can't do that, it's not gonna look like this. Except if it's offering more value, I guess, if you are talking about a terabyte per second connector, I can't buy an electrical connector like that to save my life. Uh, when I look at the uh, Amphenol connector they use for uh, NVLink to link those GPUs together at high speed, that is not a cheap connector. It, it is not a cheap <laughs> connector, but, you, but your argument <laughs> about going to smaller units yeah. means you need more connectivity. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go to smaller units, the price of that connectivity has to fall through the floor. Mm -hmm. You can't so, afford so Josh, expensive connectors. Mm -hmm. So Josh, I would disagree somewhat because some of the sockets that are made today are balanced improperly for some applications. And so being able to break these into Lego building blocks allows us to balance those sockets better. For example, if your performance is limited not by uh, HBM bandwidth, but by HBM capacity, where you just can't get enough data onto HBM to feed a GPU, being able to double or triple that capacity, even at the same bandwidth, could mean that you amortize the value of that GPU chip better. And now you're spending more of your money in the right place. And the cost doesn't actually have to fall through the floor. It just has to be you know, marginally better than what you would have had in the current design. Yeah. Total agreement. But I want to go back to what John's statement was, which is effectively, if you have these optic links, everything gets an optic link. And in your case, you have more capacity, you just put down more of them. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have a finite optical bandwidth to a sled, which is fully populated with HBM, which may be something that comes in the near future. But that each one of those HBM stacks is an optical connector. Mm -hmm. And if that's the scenario you're going for, those connectors and the, the E to o, o to E transitions have to be dirt cheap. Now, if you go to the architectural solution, which is what I was advocating earlier, you think about, okay, I'm going to have a certain amount of bandwidth optically into a region. And now that region has random chunks of memory. And personally, I wouldn't use HBM. I'd use GDR. It's cheaper. Right. It's mm -hmm. equal bandwidth. It's more efficient. Mm -hmm. Why would I pay the premium for HBM when I can get more capacity at the same bandwidth and be a lot cheaper if I have that kind of capability? No, I, That's I, just I, yeah. one of the scenarios. Yeah, no, I, I definitely believe uh, it's not just that the FRUs are hardwired. We're really talking about that uh, with the disaggregation, the anatomy of a value metric is that you have delivered performance over cost or over power. And we've always focused on the denominator, which is reducing power or reducing cost. But if you can configure things so that you're wasting less of the resource or that I can uh, do something that can't be done, uh, like such as add more GPU high bandwidth capacity uh, memory uh, uh, to the GPU, which is not possible if you're marooned inside of the package. Now we're talking about the uh, numerator of the value metric. And I think there's a lot more headroom to improve the value metric by pushing the numerator than the denominator. I agree. That, that brings me to the next point uh, that I wanted to talk about. You know, this has to pay for itself in some fashion. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stranded capacity out there. I talk to people in the HPC industry, and they say that at best, they think the average utilization of a GPU is somewhere around 10%. Sometimes some say it's 15%. Um, I haven't heard horror stories like that since the uh, dot com data centers in the late 90s. This is awful. <laughs> and 
if we can use even a PCI Express version of disaggregation to start um, and then eventually move to optics because we're gonna need to, um, to drive up the utilization and the composability of these things. And John, you had a great chart on this that showed a workflow that had AI training, AI inference, data analytics, and then HPC simulation and modeling all using the same CPUs and GPUs and other elements mished and mashed around. That's how I think it's going to work. And we're going to do that first. And that's going to help pay the bill for, you know, that stack to evolve that, we're that we've been talking about. But I, what I want to get a sense of is how much capacity do you think is actually stranded now and how far can we push it? John, go. It was your chart. Your oh, well, sure. Uh, I mean, definitely. And, and you go next. Yeah, definitely for the training and inference case that, that I have the chart for, uh, those are the more complicated cases. And uh, once you set the way that you put your pins in the motherboard and how you connect stuff together, then that's the way that node is. And that becomes a stranded resource if you're not running that much of that workload. So I have a fixed set of training racks. And man, you know, you got the DGX nodes. Uh, 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 they're really great for training, but they're the opposite land from what you want for inference. And so right now people just operate different rows of equipment for those two different workloads. So if I had the opportunity to um, use, you know, this optical circuit switches to reconfigure the same set of resources, but point the bandwidth to where it's needed, that would be a huge benefit. Uh, there's also have the chart from uh, NERSC from Brian Austin that shows that although uh, a significant portion of the workload, about 15% needs all of the memory capacity that we put in the nodes, uh, the vast majority, 75 to 80% is using less than 15% of the available memory capacity in the node. And the rest of that memory that's sitting there in the nodes just burning a hole uh, and it's not, not contributing to performance and it's definitely huge in terms of capital costs recently. So the opportunity just for something stupid simple like disaggregating the memory capacity allocation, not even the bandwidth, uh, could offer huge benefits. Ian, you raise your hand, so you get to go next. Yeah, so I think John hit some of what I was going to talk about on the memory side, which is we have two issues with memory. One is we have our CPU machines where we're not using all the memory typically, and we have our GPU machines where we don't have enough memory, which I've already talked about. And so this can help solve some of those problems. But on our GPU machines, we're seeing high utilization of our applications that tried hard to use the GPUs well. What ends up becoming a stranded resource though is the CPU. And what you see us slowly doing, and you see this happening at Oak Ridge as well, is people increasing number of GPUs per CPU because that's how to get the most bang for your buck out of your infrastructure given the current design you have. Uh, at some point, you can't get enough connectivity out of your CPU to increase the GPUs further and still have a machine that works well. Optics could allow you to kind of up those ratios, or as we've been talking about, make those composable ratios so that applications can get what they want. And you can lower your capital gain on CP, your capital costs on CPUs and other pieces that kind of make everything go, even though you'll still need CPUs uh, because they do certain things that you just can't do with accelerators. Well, we, we also think here at the next platform that it's gonna stretch out the life of a lot of components. You might not upgrade your CPU so often. You might not upgrade so, your memory that often. You know, it, it could it could change the way we upgrade things. Um, it, it might actually make a center like Livermore actually upgrade things. If we have you know a cheaper set of it, we can just leave in place and we can upgrade um, parts of the machine that might right. become attractive. Uh, whereas today we just keep running machines forever or until they fall over because uh, it, they're we just need all the compute we can get. And so there's definitely an advantage to being able to upgrade parts of the machine with this type of model or just add on to a machine as opposed to having to wheel in a whole brand new machine when it's time. If it's more expensive and you have to buy less of it to do a certain amount of work, which is what I've seen with the initial PCI Express disaggregated architectures, you can get the same work done with half the money. That's the kind of numbers I'm seeing. These are small scale things. I'm not trying to say this is like, you know, an extra scale class machine, but you know, th these components need to be used more fully. Doug, this is your business. I mean, <laughs> you know, you have to make this happen. 
Right. Just to dogpile on those comments, I mean, the problem's already very bad and it's getting worse. You know, in the AI world, we're pushing larger and larger models. Uh, we're seeing a trend towards uh, a lot of sparsity in the models, which are, is, is further uh, creating uh, pressure on, on the way that we're uh, provisioning, um, you know, discrete resources. And, um, you know, I think that uh, makes the economics of the discussion of like, what are you willing to pay for an optical solution? Uh, not a trivial trade-off, you know, if, if it's pure gigabytes, you know, dollars per gigabit per second, um, I think you're going to miss the larger picture of what the value is for um, disaggregating the resources and actually reclaiming some of the stranded resources. And it's, you know, we've been talking here about memory, but it's memory accelerators, storage. It's a really a lot of, um, of value that's stranded in the data center. And it's going to uh, move the needle uh, and push us very, very fast to, to try and get these optical solutions that will allow us to recover those resources. All right, Josh, you're next. What do you think? So I'd probably amplify what Doug said uh, and that if we think about storage and memory, because this really is about other things. If you think about storage and memory specifically, then you can think of this as a pyramid. And there are big gaps in that pyramid on a latency bandwidth characteristic. And as we have non-volatile storage, it starts to look more like regular DRAM. It's getting there. It will become that eventually. What does that really mean for storage as a concept as you disaggregate it? How does that tie into this model? And if our root is latency of communication and bandwidth and radix of communication, and the hyperscalers are going to hyperdensity installations, as Doug was saying earlier, what does this look like? How do you get there? It goes back to everything we've talked about, the, the fundamental challenges of the software stack exposing this in some kind of a model that software can reason about, use, and that you can say as a, a SLA term, hey, this packet of compute needs an AI engine. This packet of compute needs a CPU engine or something else. You're really starting to move into, you know, away from the slurm job scheduling environment and more to the orchestration telemetry of regular data center services. That's really where we're headed. We're going to do that scheduling at the hardware level on a very sophisticated network. And everything looks like an accelerator to the network. Sun used to and say the network is the computer. AI. Josh, it'll be done by AI because no human being is going to be able to manage something that big. That a AI is definitely going to kick into this, right? But yeah. it's Sun's statement, right? The network is the computer. They were just a couple of decades too early. Right. We're going to have so, a memory so, compiler. God help us all. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I well, it, it's an interesting thing though. AI might be, but there's also um, all of these uh, uh, annealers, uh, digital annealers or uh, quantum annealers, whatever. I think that the optimization problem here is actually going to be uh, borderline NP, uh, and uh, and so I. That's why I think it's a potential application of these things like uh, uh, the Fujitsu digital annealer or D-Wave or future generations of them. They may become an adjunct feature of our data center just to deal with these logistics and scheduling issues. All right, we, we're so, gonna run out of time here in a second, but glad you get the last word unless somebody else wants to pipe up. No, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely on board with, uh, with the need for, let's say a disaggregation OS, right? Or, or at least a, a way of dealing and, and programming these things. I think just to-, Any, to Anybody want to start a startup? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is why I was kind of very interested to, to read about Liquid and all these kind of efforts yeah. uh, to try to really um, attack the problem. I, I'm not saying it's the right uh, maybe end end way of doing it. I it's think a good a beginning. Of, of open source community also needs to get involved to specify that. But there are underlying technologies r just behind the hill that are rolling, like John was mentioning, op fast, very fast optical switches, um, high bandwidth uh, photonic links. All these things are effectively ready to start being considered, at least at the point of looking at starting to think of what software, what's the right software architecture that would be able to leverage them, right? Um, yeah. All right, go ahead, Ian, I'll let you finish, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to make a point and add, add on to something that Josh said, which is that you know, you're gonna start having these microservices and that's gonna require you to have a code that looks a lot more asynchronous. 
that can actually you know run on bits and pieces of this at the same time. Otherwise, by disaggregating, you might strand more resources because you need to be able to keep everything busy at the same time. So you want your AI to run at the same time. You know, GPU compute goes on at the same time. You keep the CPU busy with something else. And so, understanding your workflow and getting applications that can really be asynchronous, which pe some people claimed was going to be the exascale problem, now actually is the problem for how you make a disaggregated system work from the you know end user perspective. I'm going to make a joke and then we have to end it. Okay, the joke is: Will it take more AI to schedule this stuff than you have in the system? <laughs> No. It's, uh, it's like it's a climate modeling. Degree. Yeah, let's let's uh, run climate models in a way that doesn't add to contribute to the crisis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's that too. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, let's do some questions. Um, I wanted to ask this one before, so I'll ask it now. Um, what are the barriers to adoption? We kind of danced around a few of them, but let's. Let's enumerate them so that we can line them up so that the industry can knock them down over the next X years. And then we're gonna talk about what X is later. That's the next question after this one. So John, what, what are the barriers to adoption that we have for disaggregated architectures? And let's, let's restrict it to HPC and AI in general, I guess. Yeah, as always, you know, cost uh, is, and, and uh, supply chain. Um, uh, actually, I think uh, potentially at this point, uh, supply chain may actually be the, um, uh, uh, the most difficult issue. But there's also, as Josh pointed out, there's a whole bunch of software layers that are missing in all of this too that we would have to address. Josh, well, I'm, oh. I'm going to echo what John said, but I think it's software that's the biggest issue. I think actually making the software work is going to take a lot longer than the hardware. We could build a system today, but I'm not sure if anyone could use it. That's always true, though. So, <laughs> so, so let me throw a wrinkle into that one, and I'm sure Doug is going to want to dogpile on this one with his own view, but let's just take a step back and say we can develop the protocols and the software. That'll probably take us four or five years to get something viable. But if I take one step back, let me just assume IRS technology, right? Forget anything more aggressive because there are more aggressive things out there. And we have no test infrastructure. If I wanted to test one IR module for high volume manufacturing and test the corners and all the frequencies and all the stabilities, it's going to take at least two to three weeks per module. And I need millions of modules per month shipped for a volume production run. We don't even have the test infrastructure and equipment to do this. We are also spoiled by how easy it is to work with copper. You can put a crimp connector on copper, a vampire trace. You can print it in a PCB. You can't do any of that with photonics. There's no machinery. There's no automation for custom shuffles and cables at this kind of granularity. So, yeah, software is a big deal. But in this case, it's a lot less interesting to me than the ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Josh. The um, the way that we've been thinking about cost really does traverse through how do you make high volume manufacturing work um, test. We would really like to, you know, our vision even for HPC and AI is really deploy, you know, hundreds of thousands of these uh, optical transceivers on every single node that we connect in the, in the data center. So it's it's that high volume manufacturing. You kind of touched a little bit on reliability. The links themselves need to be as reliable as copper. As soon as we connect memory into the system, we need to make sure that the bit error rates are, are not what we're used to dealing with for ethernet. They need to be much, much better because they're gonna be um, connecting uh, memory interfaces as well. So it's it, there's, a, there's a significant number of hard problems that we have to knock off before we see widespread adoption, but it, it's the, the promise is huge. Yeah, and just to maybe uh, add to that, uh, you know, um, it's kind of very interesting that if you select the right type of optics uh, with electronic photonic integration on the same chip, you actually get a lot of visibility and uh, uh, built-in self-tests that you can administer in a photonic link at the wafer scale, um, at the package scale, as well, um, being able to actually attach something to the or a loop back, uh, even at the level of the optical connector and fiber shuffle, allows you to 
develop these different probing and testing or, or let's say sign off uh, capabilities for the system. I would argue it's actually much harder to do that for a fully enclosed uh, high speed signaling system. Uh, let's say like CXL based where you have a bunch of retimers and the board connectors. How do you probe the signal integrity of such things at, at a massive scale, um, right? Yeah, it's a very difficult problem for electrical as well, but Optis gives you these other uh, probing points. Of course, as Josh said, does that ecosystem exist currently? No, it's been tailored for pluggables where your bitter rates roar like 1E minus 4, 1E minus 6. And as Doug says, then you have to work a lot harder to recover from there. The failure mechanisms are different, right? Our uh, IRS photonic links are basically designed to operate um, at bitter rates at 1E minus 15, right? So NRZ, so it's a totally different ball game from traditional optics that you're uh, used to. But with electronic photonic integration, you can enable these best features that allow for easier system integration and test and plot. Uh, and that's, I think, where everyone is going. Nobody's thinking of just taking the pluggable, you know, and putting it in the package uh, just the way it is. And in fact, I think that's the major problem with kind of where the, pluggable style co-package optics is going because it, it, it cannot actually scale test at that level. So we've got the barriers there. What are the drivers and uh, for the use of disaggregation? I keep talking about driving up utilization to drive down cost for accelerators is what I keep thinking about or storage to a certain extent, maybe for networking a little bit. I don't know. I don't think that's the problem, but talk to me about the drivers here. Um, Thoughts, just somebody start, I don't care. <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, stranded or marooned resources, you know, so um, the, you know, the way that we provision in the data center today is that we have to provision for large um, jobs that'll come in. And so it's it's a lot of direct attach for, for memory. And so I think the um, beyond just uh, recovering the stranded resources, I'm excited about new scenarios where we can actually provide um, extra large VMs. For example, if you want, if you come in and you and you really want, you know, multiple terabyte of memory of, of VMs, it's extremely difficult to provision that in a data center today. And in a disaggregated data center, we could we could easily provide that that type of capability. So it's, it's also better application performance, right? If you can get more bandwidth into a GPU, we could use that. We have lots of applications where just the amount of bandwidth we can get in or the amount of capacity we can attach to a GPU is actually what's limiting their performance. And in addition, it enables new workflows, right? We can have some part of the workflow running on the GPU and then it pops off something over to the AI accelerator mm -hmm. and having a disaggregated system like this allows you to not have to build a static thing that's going to be too expensive because it's over provisioned and inflexible. Now your application grabs the amount of AI acceleration it needs to match with its HPC compute or other things. And so that will really get your users to actually start using this because that's the carrot that you wave in front of people, which makes it a lot easier to get adoption rather than the stick of it costs you a lot of money. Yeah. And, and the challenge there if I can just poke at what Ian was arguing, comes back to the offload model versus a services or microservices model. Because when you think about having 10,000 GPUs and 10,000 CPUs and 10,000 AI sockets all together with some kind of disaggregated memory pool and they're all peers on the network, you're now back to the question of how do you reason about the posted visibility of system state? So when you transfer compute from one type of device to another, how do you reason about that, vis the visibility of the posted rights? How do you handle those controls? And if you do it in a classic OpenMP style or MPI style, you have real issues there, I think. Yeah, yeah Josh, you're right. You're going to have to do it as task-based, where you have a quantity that gets offloaded and comes back, and someone probably running on one of those CPU cores is a little bit of an orchestrator. Um, and, you know, managing all that complexity. John, you had some thoughts. 
Yeah, I, I was going to say we should really think in terms of um, where do you get the big, the entry point is probably going to be where you can get the largest profit margin. And uh, we always talk about price, we talk about cost, and we conflate the two together, but they are two different things. And the gap between price and cost is your profit margin. Uh, they're already operating at like 70% profit margins in the AI and machine learning space. But one of the big unobtainiums in that space is having more high bandwidth memory capacity on the GPU. GPUs. Uh, and that's because it's currently unobtainium. Uh, if you could actually move into that space using this technology, then uh, you can push up your profit margin. So damn the costs if you can push up your profit margin. I have my doubts about uh, the profit margins in AI over the long term because HPC yeah. has not demonstrated huge profits over its long and illustrious life. <laughs> it's very hard to make money in this business. Yeah, it's very easy to make money in the enterprise space where everyone buys a little bit of something. You can kind of jack the price up a little bit. So yeah. I, I don't I don't necessarily want AI to look like HPC <laughs> for that reason, because the vendors can't make a living out of it. You know, so I, I get nervous about it. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I got a slightly different way of looking at it. Yeah, I, I was thinking totally from the standpoint of what we've learned from the Facebook and the um, uh, the Google folks. Not not actually, I'm not not wearing my HPC hat when I say that's where the profit center is. As far as I can tell, it's Red Hat, Intel, uh, NVIDIA. That's where the profit centers are in the. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Vladimir, I would rather it be distributed <laughs> a little bit more evenly. But um, so. Vlad, do you have any thoughts here? Uh... Um, you know, it, it kind of connects back to the barriers as well. Um, for this to work, uh, unlike in networking, where you just need kind of uh, a network interface and a switch, here you need um, an XPU to have a photonic interface and a memory side also to have a photonic interface. Uh, and it's it's a matter of the ecosystem, right? Everyone kind of coming in and understanding this is needed and building the bo both the sides. But the, the, pro the premium is, as, as people have uh, already mentioned here, you're kind of democratizing access to, to the large amount of memory. GPUs can now have it, multiple of them, multiple CPUs, different types of accelerators. Um, what to what extent it can be shared uh, within that pool goes back to, to discussions about the global address space and things like that and how how ready these xpus are to support that but you are at least let's say with cxl you're, you're kind of setting up the initial framework that allows you to do that at some satisfactory level and then the question is how quickly can you roll an update to let's say cxl or the next generation protocol that will be fully uh capable of utilizing this uh capability i've got time i think for one more question if we all talk fast how long is it going to take to get to this glorious future that we are thinking about where things where a disaggregated system is normal and there are probably steps along the way but um talk to talk to me about that uh ian you go first i guess 10 to 15 years um you can have steps along the way but you know it's going to be five years before you can make a lot of the more complicated software and other layers you've got pricing that has to come down, volumes that have to go up. Uh, maybe in 10 years, you'll start to see those really bleeding edge, fully disaggregated systems. In 15 years, it might start to become more mainstream. So we have we have jobs for a while yet, so that's good. <laughs> Any, anyone want to pipe up? I, I think I'm a little bit more bullish on seeing um, systems that start to approach that within the next four years. Um, I, I think it's, you know, Ian's got a great point about how long does it take to actually push volume so that the cost comes down so that it's ubiquitous. But, you know, today we have um, some, some amount of storage disaggregation, some amount of accelerator in the form of FPGA disaggregation in our data center. And so we, we're starting to see the baby steps already. And I, I think, you know, in four years, we'll, we'll start to see some systems that, um, show the characteristics of, of the vision that we've laid out here. I would go stronger than Doug um, because I agree with what Doug is saying for deployed systems, but I think you'll see prototypes within the next two years uh, that you will see stood up and demonstrated within 18 to 24 months, truly scalable systems using this kind of a, an approach. But the question you asked is a little tricky because you need to decouple optics 
from the question of disaggregated systems. What Doug and I are talking about is going to be stood up with electrics because mm -hmm. we have to, because of the stranded resources. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to see is a shift and a pivot. As we put more IO demand on sockets and resources, we're going to have to go to other technologies. The optics will bring about a further shift to disaggregation, but I think there's a continuum here. It's not like it's all, all or nothing. That's right. And I think the software stack gets developed on PCI Express to just nail it down. And we're going to get really good at that. And that's where we see the adoption. I mean, and people are already doing this over Google and Facebook are already doing some level of disaggregation over regular AOCs. You know, they pack a whole bunch of AOCs in the back of the cabinet, but uh, it will be a slow shift, you know, starting with things like storage and NVRAM. And as we shift to faster and faster link technologies, uh, more and more aspects of the system could be potentially disaggregated. So I think it's going to be 15 years to get to the Uber system, but there'll be lots of small steps in along the way. All right, Vladimir, you get the last word. Yeah, you know, it's it's really good to uh, hear these uh, time horizons. You know, in terms of the optics, uh, triplet technology, kind of the, the basic technology, you know, you're talking about proofs of concept within a year and and high volume within, let's say, two years. Uh, but acknowledge that when you're talking about this segregation system, you're really talking about the whole system, chassis, rack scale. And I think for that to hit some sort of a reasonable proof of concept with, let's say, hundreds of sockets or, or uh, thousands of sockets, you're, you're talking about three to four years and really high volume manufacturer between four and eight years, I would say. Um, all right, we have to end it there. I'd like to thank all of our participants and our panelists. I hope this has been interesting. Thank you thank all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.